Okay, please welcome our guests tonight with a warm welcome, Pete Doctor and Jonas Rivera. Thank you, thank you. Hey, Pete. Welcome to Berlin. Thank Jonas you. Jonas and Pete, thank you very much here. for coming out. Um, the first question, basically, I mean, you've been asked this a thousand times probably already, but how did you come up with the idea for Inside Out? Uh, yeah, well, uh, it started kind of thinking of um, emotions as characters. I don't know where that idea really came from. Uh, it just kind of popped in my head. And, and thinking about how uh, what animation does really well is strong, opinionated, kind of over-the-top exaggerations of, of people. That just seemed perfect for this subject. and. Um, at the same time, my daughter was 11, and she had gone from being sort of a goofy, you know, very rambunctious little kid to being a little more quiet, a little more laid back. And that change was something that I remember going through myself. And I thought, what if we put these ideas together and we try to explain what it's like to grow up and what happens inside of your head when that, when that occurs? I heard that at first you started out with, I think, 25 or 30 different emotions. How did you narrow it down to the basically five that we meet? Yeah, it's, I mean, as soon as Pete had that idea, which we all at the studio thought that was a great idea, let's, let's figure this out, we, we quickly realized that we're not, believe it or not, experts on emotions and uh, the, the human mind and so forth. So we did a lot of research and thought, well, we first better find out what, how many emotions do we have and what do they do and why do we have them? And We thought science could tell us right. some definitive answers. And then we, so the first list we looked at said there are 27 clinical emotions in, in, you know, in the human body. And then, and then the next list said there are six. And the next list said there are three. Someone <laughs> said there are none. Yeah. So we thought, well, that's good news and bad news. We can kind of do what we want. But, we, but through the various lists, the five, you know, joy, anger, fear, disgust, and sadness were pretty consistent, yeah. wouldn't you say? And, and, and they also felt right for the story you were trying to craft. And so we kind of narrowed it down so, you know, Emotions like Schadenfreude didn't make it, <laughs> unfortunately. Ah, okay. We experimented with Schadenfreude, but um, the, the, I had the pleasure of, uh, of flying over to San Francisco and basically visiting the Pixar studios. And uh, some of the uh, people, the animators who worked there, basically said that you get together and you present an idea, and then it gets decided if it will be turned into a movie. Especially John Lasseter, as someone who's always yeah. sort of talking about it. How did you make sure with that idea that you had in your head in the beginning that it will turn out to be a movie? Uh, well, I mean, for, I guess to start out, you, you sort of, to do a feature, you're sort of invited. It's not just like anybody from the studio can start pitching things. Um, so we kind of bet on, on folks that we feel have strong potential as a director. As Ed Catmull says, we, we bet on people, not ideas, because if the ideas fail, good people will generate more ideas. So um, generally, uh, the directors kind of come from story. Uh, they have experience. They watch other folks and, and kind of work their way up. And really, the way the stories evolve is very organic. I mean, I remember as a kid, I always had this thought that the way stories uh, were generated, they would just leap forward from the brains of geniuses fully formed. Like, you know, Walt would just go, Dumbo, and, and it would all exist, you know. <laughs> and that's not really the way it works. It's much more piecemeal, and it's very uh, much a discovery. So as I mentioned, you know, the original idea had to do with emotions and growing up. And then I pitched it to Jonas and uh, Ronnie Del Carmen, our co-director. We talked about it. We had some thoughts. We experiment. We write on whiteboards. We pin up cards. We talk to other people. We pitch to Andrew. And before you know it, you're adding and subtracting and arranging things. Um, and so it's a very messy, organic process. The great thing is, especially at the premiere yesterday at the Zoo Palace, um, to <clears> see how the audience responds to what you created. Um, and I think it's important for people to understand how much work goes into this process. As you've been saying it, there's an idea and then there's a lot of work. Yeah. Jonas, how long did it take and how strenuous is it? And yeah. uh, how many times did you think, are we gonna make it to the end, I mean, to yeah. the finished product? Well, I mean, th this moment Pete's talking about where he first came up with the idea and then we kind of distilled it down and you pitched it to John Lasseter, who's the creative head. That was over five years ago. You know, and, and that was when we started um, you know, putting it together. That was, and it, we all agreed, well, it's a really good idea. 
and we saw John Lasseter kind of sit forward in his chair, and he's a great, you know, um, metric for the pulse of the audience. Like if John Lasseter likes something, then we kind of know, okay, this might be worth, let's, let's push on this. But um, I don't know, it took at least two or three years of work to get it from a concept, like a cool idea about emotions in the head to a story. I mean, right? I there's mean, a, yeah, exactly. But, there's a real sexiness and an appeal to a, an idea, right? Where did the idea come from? But really, where the rubber hits the road is all the work. Because you could take a kind of a mediocre idea and with the right people craft it into something that really sings. Yeah. And you could have a great idea, and if it's not put across properly, it'll, you know, doesn't, doesn't ring with people. I mean, one of the things we do is we, 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 in the process of making a movie at Pixar, we draw the whole movie on storyboards. Right, so people write the script with two writers and we'll storyboard the entire movie, single drawings, and then we'll cut that together and we'll do the voices ourselves or people in the crew and we'll watch that, you know, 90 minute version simulated of, of a movie. So I call it our story reel. We'll get everybody in the room, the Pixar sort of executives and brain trust, the creative Brad Birds and Andrew Stanton and John Lasseter. And we'll do this every 16 weeks, you know, on average, and we noticed the first three or four times we screened it that, that we, we'd hear a lot of, wow, it's a really great idea. And then the second time, this is such a fun idea, and so forth. And then we realized we, no one is saying the word movie. Yeah, that's not a compliment. Know? Even if we, we <laughs> almost wanted people, even if it's a bad movie, we want to get it to being a movie, and that's where we realized, wow, we have a lot of, a lot of work to do to actually thread it through to being a narrative structure. And it's a hugely successful movie. It has, I think, done more than 700 million US dollars at the box office so far. Yeah, and worldwide, it's going to yeah. Worldwide. Yeah. Um, and the great thing is that you basically follow Riley from day one up until uh, now. She's, how old is she at the end? 11, basically. At the very end, she's 12. 12. But yeah. And uh, we're going to take a look at one of the clips. Oh, uh, I think this is younger. earlier on, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. How did, you, how did you go about, uh, you know, creating those two worlds visually? You know, the real world that Riley lives in and her imagination with the emotions. Yeah, it wasn't easy because unlike, uh, you know, Nemo or Cars, you have reference. You can look at a picture of a fish or a car and go, well, it should sort of basically look like this with some, uh, you know, caricature and whatnot. In this case, we had nowhere to start, really, because what does fear look like as anything? You know, I know what it feels like. And that's really where we started, was to say, I want these emotions to look the way our emotions feel to us. So everything from the texture they're made of, you'll, you'll notice if you look closely, it's not skin or, or cloth or something. It's, it's like energy. And we came up with this new technology to make all these particles, almost like atoms, kind of held together to approximate the spirit of uh, like an energy. Um, uh, and from there, uh, it was really just trusting our artists. We have some amazing artists who would s just fill this room with thousands of drawings. And Jonas and I would walk in and kind of go, whoa, <laughs> OK. And then you just start methodically going through and dissecting the thought process. In some cases, we had little clues like, um, you know, in English, we'll say, I feel blue if you're sad, or, um, you know, I'm about ready to explode with rage, or things like this that, that could maybe be little clues to what they would look like. But by and large, it was They just... translate perfectly into German. Do they? We, yeah, exactly. Okay. Explodieren for Wut. Yeah, the same there you thing. go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the things that was fun with the characters, I remember Albert Lozano, our character art director, because there was a lot of great talk about feeling, which is really yeah. cool. And he came with this real simple idea that um, they're almost even shaped based, like there was a shape, he drew Joy as a star, and even you can see her, she was she's golden, and she's like a sparkler, yeah. right? And sadness is a teardrop, he just drew that shape. And fear, sort of like a squiggly line, like a raw nerve. Uh, anger is, of course, a bri brick, <laughs> this immovable brick. And disgust is sort of the shape and color of a piece of broccoli, which, of course, is universally <laughs> disgusting. And even just starting elemental kind of gave them a certain grammar that we thought was fun, you know? And, How important and became was part of the character. basically lighting the characters as well? Because if you look at it, for example, Joy, as you've been saying it, she has this energy glow yeah. to her. How important was that? Well, yeah, we wanted her to feel uh, like she is emitting light, which if you, you know, if you take a picture of a light bulb, it's just a big white flat thing. So if we really did it accurately, Joy would be like a white flat thing. And so uh, we had to make up a lot of... Uh, 
technology and, and faking it to give her uh, rounding and sculpting and still have her look vibrant. And, and a, that was, you know, a lot of people think uh, the way you make a computer film is you just go, make film, enter. And uh, the truth is that that's just one of many things where we faked stuff. We, we were very conscious of uh, how we wanted the thing to appear on screen. And it's a handmade film. It's really using a computer, but made by people, made by hand. The great thing is, uh, as I've been saying it yesterday, to watch the audience, there were little kids and, uh, with their parents, and the parents oh, were crying, the kids were laughing. <laughs> and I think that's the amazing thing about Pixar movies, that it's a, it's a family movie. You can watch it, and, cool. and yeah. people will see do two different kinds of movies. How do you go about creating a story that appears to kids as well as to adults? How do you sort of turn that out of the, out of the idea? Yeah. I, I, I think that's one of the things we're most proud of with the film is we grew up, uh, the way, I, the reason even I think we work together is because we grew up on the great Disney films, you know, the golden age of Disney's in the 30s through the 60s. And just uh, on the way here, Jonas was singing the theme from Lady and the Tramp. That's true. Yeah. That's a true story. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it is true. And uh, but we talk about that constantly. And, and there's something about those movies that, you know, I saw them when I was a kid as one thing. You know, I saw Dumbo when I was very little, and I, you know, I laughed at the elephants or at Timothy of the Mouth. I see it now with a very different lens. It's a very sophisticated story. It's emotional. There's truth to it. And, and um, I think we start on these films not really thinking about it. We don't think about kids or families necessarily. We sort of selfishly think about us. I mean, John Lasseter is sort of, the only rule we really have is make a movie you would want to go see. Like, what is it? Let's be our own audience. Maybe make a movie you would take your family to see, you know, sort of the second question. So we, that's our point of departure. And obviously, we know families are going to go, and we hope anyway, and that kids will, will go. And so we work in layers so that, you know, we, we tell the story we want to tell, and then we sort of add things in so that there's humor and balance, and it's not too heavy. But it's also, to us, it's not worth making unless it's meaningful to us. So, you know, we, we I don't know, I think we just kind of baby step towards a core that's truthful and emotional but fun. Yeah, I think a lot of people have this vision of us taking market surveys and figuring out what do 12 to 14 year old boys like and so on. It's really no. just us kind of intuiting what we feel is important to talk about and then telling the story to each other a lot and high, fi, you know, refining it and honing that story. Because I doubt, <laughs> I doubt any market research would lead us to like, let's make a house about an old man who flies his yeah, house away, right. make a movie about that. That's, right. That'll be a hit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just gave a great cue because I think balance is very important to the storyline as well. I mean, even though everyone loves disgust, anger, and fear, it's all about joy and sadness. Mm -hmm. And we have a clip that sort of describes their friendship and um, oh, the uh, situation they're in. Yeah. Of course, that's... Not working. Yeah, it's not working. In the, in the English version, that's uh, Phyllis Smith as sadness and, and Amy Poehler as joy, who are... Yeah, fantastic together. Yeah. Really contributed a lot, not only to the voice, but to the writing and the crafting of the characters, and uh, they were great to work with. Yeah. We have the dub version in, in German. Um, how does it work with the voices in the original version of the movie? I mean, do you pick a person, a voice talent, who's going to be perfect for the character, and then sort of draw the character based on that person, or do you create the character first and then sort of has, have the voice talent to add. Well, it's kind of a cyclical thing yeah. where we'll design the characters and uh, come up with basically the final design and then we listen to a bunch of voices and go, who seems best suited for this? Once we cast the characters, once we cast the actor, we work a lot with the actor to um, hone and refine the writing of it. So you start to hear the voices, the, the kind of words they would use and the phrasing and the cadence and so you end up rewriting quite a lot for the actors. It's kind of tailor-made for that actor. The animators pick up cues, too, from, yeah. from just the way they behave and perform and read. And, and sometimes we've even heard, the animators do a really great job of that. And we'll record each, video, each session, you know, just with the actor performing. And so we've heard things like, like uh, you know, boy, Dory sure looks like Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> And of course, she looks nothing like Eleanor, but she might Fetch. behave or maybe shrug or, you know, yeah. there will be nuances that... <laughs> Expressions. Yeah. One other thing that I love about Pixar movies is that you always reference other movies within a movie. Hmm. Um, in this one, there are a couple of scenes as well. Um, 
are there sort of things that you would tell the audience to look out for that they should pay attention to? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I know that you have, you know, some of the street names in, in past movies were named after the animators or people who have worked on the movie. Yeah, we, we, we do tend to sneak our names into things and our kids' names, and, and this movie's no different. I mean, there's, there's a couple of traditions we have where we have, like, you know, the Luxo Ball, which was the original sort of Pixar short. It's usually in every movie. There's a, in Toy Story, there was a pizza delivery truck, the Pizza Planet truck. That, for some reason, has been our... We think we're so clever by sneaking <laughs> that in the movie, and we're, it, it, no one else cares about it but us. But now we've heard people ask about it, so that's in there somewhere. Well, we guess, also take something from the future. Right. Right. So the good dinosaur. The good dinosaur is our next movie, and if you watch close, you you might see a dinosaur somewhere. I mean, where that in the all movie. came from was the idea that you can't just go to a thrift store or a furniture store and go, I like that lamp. Let's put it in the movie. You you have to build everything and shade everything. You know, texture everything. So we figure, well, we might as well make it, if we can save a couple uh, hours of somebody's time by grabbing it from another film, great. If we can make it, you know, a little yeah. bit personal to us, even better. So that's kind of where yeah, all that I started. Think, I think it was born on A Bug's Life, now that you say it. Uh, in, in A Bug's Life, there was a scene where they go to the city, and the city was under a porch, and, 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 the, and the plant, we needed a truck and a trailer. Yeah. And so we just grabbed Pizza Planet truck and converted it from the model library from Toy Story. But then people noticed it and called it out, so we thought that was funny. So we did it, and then we did the same Toy thing Street in Monsters and all that. <laughs> yeah. So we were just trying to save We are cheap, <laughs> and now it's like, we're clever. <laughs> Let's get back to the research, because you've been talking about the emotions, and scientists who you've been talking to basically told you how many emotions there are. But I heard that you went uh, as well to factories, basically to, to look for the right look for the headquarters, <laughs> and Imagination Land is probably inspired by your love for, for the Disney parks. Yeah. What were you looking for, and what did you actually take to put into the movie? Yeah, it was the art department. Yeah. The art department who was doing a lot of the design work. We just started thinking about, okay, what uh, in the real world is kind of like this, where there are a lot of, of, of one object uh, that need to be sorted in some way. And we came up with the idea of um, uh, chicken, like an egg farm. <laughs> and so uh, one of the guys who used to work at Pixar actually owned an egg farm in his family. And so the art department went up looked at all the chickens and the way they sort eggs and the process by which, and you know, we, I don't know that there's a ton of that that's seen in the film, but some of the thinking uh, kind of ended up yeah, influencing it. Just yeah. looking for things that, that inspire the functionality of how it might work. They also went to the jelly belly factory, like the oh, yeah. jelly bean factory, just like how do things move around and how are things sorted, functionality, design, color, anything. It's, you know, ev we look everywhere for inspiration and, um, find it in strange places. How has working on the movie changed your outlook and some of the you know, decisions and your inner emotions <laughs> that you use? Yeah, it's a good question. It. I mean, it, it definitely uh, opened our eyes uh, to a lot of things. One, just the way, how much effect emotions have on us and how invisible it is. You know, you've, you feel when you decide, I'm going to choose a, a new uh, shirt and I want purple. Uh, that I am the guy who's choosing that. But there's so many layers to the way your brain works and so many uh, influences that are completely invisible to you that are really controlled by this whole other uh, thought process of the emotions. And so just kind of being, uh, waking up to that uh, was, was pretty stunning. Yeah. I, I would say for me, the, the, just the simple idea that uh, and through the research we learned this, that the emotions have a reason, which, you know, I, kind of knew that maybe academically, but not, hadn't really thought that, that there's a reason why we have emotions, specific, specific ones, like disgust, for example, which I had thought of, and you, and you saw her in the clip. Um, I thought of disgust, see, now I say her, like in my mind, she's totally personified forever, <laughs> yeah. but the, I thought of disgust as like a reaction, and, a physical, and it is a physical reaction, kind of, but through the research, all the way back to Darwin, disgust is um, there to prevent you from being poisoned. So even that face you make, like a baby eating the wrong thing, is to prevent your, yeah, there it is. Spitting um, out. Spitting out food. And of course, we played it more like socially so that she wouldn't, 11 you know, year old girl, wear the wrong thing to school or so forth. But that, that was actually functional. Or like anger, which is perceived as negative, it's easy to perceive. You say, don't be angry. Um, but, but really, anger is fueled by injustice, and the need for social justice is often fueled by anger. And so it's about fairness. And that's important. That's not just a negative 
reaction. That's actually an important function. So that was really inspiring to the movie. And also, I mean, just that made me, I don't know, it opened my eyes a little bit differently on things, which is pretty cool. Just to clarify the thing, I, I definitely Jonas, what Jonas was talking about was a huge contributor to the design and, and the writing of the characters. Yeah. Um, to put a point on what I was talking about earlier, there was a study of this guy who somehow, uh, through brain trauma, I believe, had no emotion. And he was separated from the emotional center of his brain. And even something as simple as, should I sign this document in red or black, took him a half an hour because he couldn't, he said, well, I have more black pens, so I should use the black. Oh, but red would show that it's not a Xerox, so I should use red. Oh, but black, you know, so there's this back and forth of, if you purely use logic, you never get anywhere. So much of what we decide, or what drives us through life is this emotional driven, invisible stuff. So what about the, the, the other one that I love about the fear? Was it the, the woman who lost the ability to feel oh, fear? Yeah, that was pretty wild. <laughs> She, what was that story? Sorry. She, she was, um, she had, I think, some sickness, Trauma which allowed, she basically could not feel fear, which we'd think, wow, that'd be great. I, you know, I could do all this stuff and not feel inhibited. Yeah, literally afraid of nothing. She ended up getting mugged three times, taken kidnapped twice, uh, because she had no ability to read what might be a bad situation, you know? And so the thing that kind of protects us, which is, of course, fear is triggered by uncertainty. She didn't have that intuitively, and, and so she ended up in all this trouble. Now, the, the positive side was, whereas for one of us, if we were kidnapped, that would be a trauma. I'd never go back to that shopping center where that happened. For her, it was like, well, that happened yesterday. Um, <laughs> right, you know, it had no imprint of an emotional uh, importance. But, That's but, a movie in itself. Isn't yeah, that crazy? I know. But we would take things like that, we would dig around in the research, and that was such an amazing story. Like, of course, fear in the movie then would very much think he has an important job, and he does. Yeah. Right? He's not wrong. So it was, it, was, it was just an example of how it infused the movie a bit. Cool. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Gentleman right here in the fourth row on the side with there the black t shirt. Yes. Um, I'd really like to know how you guys approach sequels and, and what's harder? Is it coming up with something new or is it approaching a sequel where you've got a world and characters that exist already and what are the differences between those two processes, if any? Yeah. So whatever we're doing is hardest. Yeah. <laughs> right? They're, you've talked about this. this. I think they both have their own challenges. Obviously, with an original film, you're coming up with these characters in the world from scratch, and so that just takes time. Um, however, when you're doing a sequel, you're stuck with all the rules and decisions you made on the first one, and you made those decisions for a specific design reason, you know, that, that say, Woody uh, goes from selfish to selfless. And so there's a backstory and all this stuff that we've come up with, thinking no further than the end of this film. Now, if you start over here, you're stuck with all these decisions. And so it's like a more complicated puzzle where the pieces are smaller and you, you only, I don't know what the analogy I'm trying to reach for there, but it's, it's got its own challenge for sure. I think the way we approach it uh, generally is that um, if we feel there's a, a real great story that, need, that bears uh, telling, um, then we'll dive in and, and start searching around for a sequel. Um, uh, a lot of films, we don't feel that, and other ones, we do. I mean, this one basically asks for a sequel because we <laughs> want to see Riley and, you know, hitting puberty, basically. Oh, I, I don't think, think we want to see that. We, uh, fear we, and uh, anger and... I think we're, that'd be a horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, <laughs> the first R-rated Pixar movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, gentleman right here with the glasses in the second row, and then... Um, I just wanted to ask if when you're crafting on the story, maybe very early, you just draw stuff or you start writing all the time or is it balance or what would you say? That's a good question. I think for us, uh, writing and, and drawing are the same thing. Uh, they're both a way of putting ideas down and kind of uh, communicating it to each other. So uh, if it's easier to write it and I can clearly communicate it to someone else, great. If, uh, if uh, an idea is complex, I mean, as an example, I remember sitting on this film specifically and thinking about these ideas and we would describe them to each other and we would talk for like an hour and a half and be I'd like, I can't picture at all what you're talking And I would look over and Ronnie would have drawn something and go like this and you're like, 
Oh, yeah, totally. That's, that's it. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes drawings just speak louder than, than words. <laughs> uh, so we use them both kind of back and forth as the process goes on. Anything else to add to that? No, that's good. That's good. A question from the gentleman right there. Perfect. Hi. Uh, um, yeah. I'm going to stand, so everyone, oh, actually, you can't see me. Oh. <laughs> we, are, we are fine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm a screenwriter uh, living here in Berlin, and I guess um, this is already a bunch of us here, actually, and probably some more. Um, yeah, hi. Hi. <laughs> Screenwriters of Berlin. Um, uh, I was wondering, uh, where do you see um, those, the future of, of screenwriting actually going? Because uh, I was wondering if you actually see the, um, the computer games, you, you know, with all these... Uh, immersions, uh, uh, reality, you know, augmented reality and those kind of things as, as your um, real contender for, uh, for, for the future. Uh, will, do you, or, or do you see yourself like making pictures um, that we will see in, in, in the cinema theaters uh, for the next uh, 20 or 30 years? I mean, we certainly, we, our medium is feature-length animated films, and that's what we do. That's our wheelhouse, and we love it. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's clear that, I mean, in the U.S. at least, I mean, dramatic movie making is, almost feels like it's shifted to television, right? Like long format writing, and directors and writers are, seem to be leaning that way. Animation's hard to think about scaling to that. But we've, we've talked about, like, is there a longer... Is there a longer format? Um, I don't think about it in terms, at least I don't, in terms of like what's going to challenge us in the future. I mean, I like to think that we're going to continue to make movies until somebody stops us, really, until like it doesn't kind of financially work for the studio. And so far, we've been pretty lucky because they've you've been successful and received well around the world, and, and there's still a model for that. But you, you kind of, we've talked a little bit about kind of the death of the smaller movie. There's either like super independent movie or like, tentpole Transformers movie, and there's not, I don't know, uh, like Tom McCarthy movies or something. He's like the yeah. last one to do it. And so it is an character-based it, it, character dramatic movies. It, it is sort of a shifting field. I mean, I don't really have a great answer other than we are sort of four-walled in in Northern California, a, a, which is enough distance from Hollywood um, to not totally worry about it. I don't mean that to be... I mean, we do sound, think about yeah, it a lot. We have a lot it. of meetings about and discussions over dinner. Like, should we be looking into web-based stuff? You know, should we? Uh, there was a, a big uh, initiative a while back about, uh, as you mentioned, video games, like choose your own adventure kind of a thing. Yeah. Which is a totally different kettle of fish, I think. Yeah, and I, I'll tell you this though: we never think about it in terms of the technology, like is virtual reality or right. other other things. Is that going to be a driver? That seems completely divorced from storytelling to us. We just think about the story movies and ideas and characters and whether or not that's worthy of a movie. And I think we're going to continue to, to do that. For better or worse, so far, uh, the stuff we've done has been totally generated by the passion of people who are working on it. So I think if somebody at Pixar said, you know, I really want to do a long format thing, and here's a plan for how I could do it, we'd probably go that way. Um, at least experiment with it. Question from... Yeah, all the way in the back. Hello. Hi there. Um, in the trailer, I had the impression that the um, emotions in the three heads, uh, the five emotions were um, depicted as male in the dad's head, as female by attributes mm -hmm. in, the, um, in mom's uh, head, and as different genders <laughs> in um, the main character's head. How do you came to this uh, relations? Yeah, I mean, the, re the real answer is it was about comedy <laughs> uh, and clarity. So uh, with Riley, our main character, obviously we wanted as much diversity and uh, broad spectrum as we could. So we started with that. And then as we got into this sequence, we initially, I think we actually tried it with a we mix did, yeah. of moms and dads. But there are 18 characters and four sets, and you're cutting like this. And so what it ended up being very confusing. We were saying, like, who said that? Yeah. Which one was Where, that? Mom's head? I don't know. Anger? Why is he saying that? Oh, that's mom's head. So we went just for the dummy proof version of, like, all of my dads have the mustaches and moms have the wig. And, and that just seemed, everybody, like, the scene kind of lit up when we did that. So it's not an attempt to say anything about 
uh, genders or anything like that. It was just for right. trying to get laughs. <laughs> but we, later, though, we did, because we thought about it, too. We thought, well, maybe <laughs> when the scene was done, well, maybe when you're young, you haven't calcified exactly who you are, and so you might have different voices. And then when you're older, you set in your ways. And we're like, well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. But that's really reason. just us trying to be smart. It was really just to get laughs. <laughs> And the end credits. I mean, the end credits, basically, you have to stay for the end credits because yeah. then there are a couple more it's a fun characters, uh, fun-based, especially with the five emotions yeah. and different yeah. kind of versions of... Yeah, I, saw, I, I saw a kid. So was, so was there a younger kid with their hand up? There. Can we uh, hear oh, that okay. one? Okay. I love a kid. Don't you? <laughs> with the red shirt? <laughs> yeah, that hidden. Ah, wunderbar. Hello. How long would it usually take you to make one scene? Oh. Too long. Too long. Well, Very let's long. See. I guess, the, first of all, just in terms of the definitions, we have the way we kind of break up the movie into sequences, we call them. Um, so like the dinner is one sequence, and that's usually anywhere from like 30 seconds to, I don't know, six minutes? Yeah, yeah. Dinner seems about four and a half minutes, I think. Depending on what it is. Yeah. And what would you, what would you say, like, if it's a four-minute sequence? Well, it, it's seasonal. That was the first scene we did, and that took us almost a year because we were ramping up and going slow we're from still learning. beginning to end. I would say um, three months, like okay. on average, from a scene when you kind of kick off the scene and start building shots to when you get it into lighting and through the pipeline, three or four months. So this is why we're old men sitting up here because yeah. it takes so long. It's so slow. I mean, what's, a, what's the anim an av animator will average? Uh, I can do about a second per day. So yeah. in a good week, you have five seconds that you've done for that week, and that's, that's pretty good. And depending on how many characters are in that one shot, it might be slower or yeah. faster, and there's 1,500 shots in the movie, and you know. That's a lot. Our beards are growing. <laughs> <laughs> so in the first week, it's all about joy, and then after three months, it's all about anger, basically. So kind of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you know. Okay, we only have time for one more question oh. from the gentleman right there. Sorry about it. Right there with the, yep. Um, is it possible to speed up the process? Because it's hard to think that we have to wait five years to get your next movie. Speed up the process. <laughs> Boy. I, anyone have any ideas? <laughs> we have tried. We would love to. We did. We sat, <laughs> we sat when we first thought, what if we did this? Could we do it in three years? And we convinced ourselves we can. And that probably gets us just enough fuel to get it to the normal yeah. five years. And then years. at year three, I'm like, please, Jonas, give us a little more time, just yeah. a little, little longer to figure this out. You know, it, it ends up just very complex. I mean, it's um, all about story, though. That, yeah. That's the reason. Yeah, I mean, of the five years that, that we've spent from pitch to finish, I'd say three of that is story. Yeah. Essentially what we call pre-production. And then the, if so, somehow if like from the heavens could come the perfect script, <gasps> we could probably do that in, I don't know, 18 months? Yeah. Two yeah. years? Maybe two years. Yeah. That's, that would be flying, right? I'm still waiting. I mean, we worked, we worked with, <laughs> I mean, Amy Poehler did three seasons of her show yeah. while we did, you know, the you one movie. You guys still working on this? She's like, I did two movies in three, you guys are slow. But all that complaining said, I mean, we do have, I would challenge what you said earlier. I think we have the best job in the world. Yeah. Because we get to. Um, you have a good job. Somebody yeah. comes to us and says, hey, what do you guys want to do? And we pitch some stuff. And then we get to work with these amazing people. Um, I challenge anybody to find a studio full of more talent than, than has been assembled at Pixar. It's pretty it's fun. Overwhelming. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, we have this amazing opportunity to come places like this and show people like you what we've, what we've done. And, yeah. and I, I could have never dreamed that I would be that lucky no, growing I up. I agree. It's really, really cool. We're really proud of the movie, and uh, it's, it's, it's everything we've got in, the, in that picture. So you know, we, we really hope everyone likes it. And we're very happy to have you here. And last but not least, really quickly, picking up on that question, yeah. can you give us an outlook on the next couple of years, what's coming yeah. you know, our way? Yeah, there's a lot. There's, I don't know if there's ever been more in the production pipeline and development pipeline at Pixar. I mean, we've been there over 20 years. And um, I mean, next is The Good Dinosaur, which yeah, comes a, up like I right after. November, it's a real banner year for November Pixar. November in Germany as well. Yeah. First year that we've had two films in one year. 
Uh, and and that one, yeah, November. And it's so, really it's really spectacular. I can't wait for people to see it and the, the trailers come in and yeah. you guys are going to love it's it. So different than than this film, but you know, so brilliant and and wonderful to watch. So. And then Finding Dory, is a sequel to Andrew Stanton, who directed Finding Nemo. That's coming out after. Um, Toy Story. Toy Story. You're going to see another Toy Story movie. Mm -hmm. That John is, Lasseter is directing that. He's back in the director chair, and it's, yeah. it's so... And here's the basic plot. Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our, thank you so much, Jonas and like, Pete. <laughs> thank you very much for coming yeah. out. Um, thank as you, we guys. said, uh, Inside Out is opening up on the 1st of October. Thank you very much for helping us. Thank, thank you, you for the like Thank you so much. Good evening.